suicide is a silent killer. This week I deviated from the NCOPD list. I'm not sure if I missed it, but I never added resiliency to the list of subjects. More than anything else, resiliency is the absolute cornerstone of professional development. A couple weeks ago, we saw statistics of Air Force suicide rates so far for 2017. By my standard, even one is too many. The damage done by even one suicide to the airmen, the family, the mission, and all the lasting impact is impossible to account for. Most folks don't know, but I've had struggles with PTSD and depression. I was hospitalized for suicidal ideation. It was a pretty dark time. Most folks who knew me never would have suspected that I was struggling so much. My wife was most surprised. She knew I was stressed at work, but one day I just didn't come home from work because I'd been admitted to the hospital. In those days, I did a lot of things wrong and a lot right. The best thing I did was make that phone call. I got over my pride and admitted I had a problem. I sought help and I got it. And after the process was done, I got promoted. I got a position I'd wanted for years. And now I have a new baby. If I hadn't made that call, if I hadn't had the support of my fellow airmen, I would have missed this and destroyed a lot of lives along with my own. My resiliency during a hard time really paid off. When Sergeant Picard spoke at the last commander's event, I was really impressed with his approach. He hits the topic of resiliency with a lot of passion. Honestly, he sort of flipped the subject for me. I came away from our interview with a different perspective and a lot more enthusiasm. I wanted to talk to you about the resiliency thing. So remember uh, like months ago now, were you at that commander's call where I sent out that list? Yes. Okay. And I don't know why resiliency was never on that list. Right. Because I don't think of that as yeah, yeah, yeah. an NCOPD subject. Right. But it's still an airmanship subject. Yeah, absolutely. And then recently I got thinking about it because the commander sent out those stats for right. the suicide rates. Yeah. That, you know, I guess, was it 2012 was the worst? 2014? Right. right. 2016 was all right, but it looks like 2017 there's yeah. another uptick yeah. again. And so we have to talk about that kind of stuff. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, you know? no. It's interesting, you know, like resilience training, a lot of the times, like you said, it kind of gets overlooked. Right? It, right. Gets, it gets passed over as this. And, I, and, and it makes me cringe every time I hear it. People will be like, I think it's the term resilience. People hear the term resilience and some people yeah. in certain occupations and AFSCs think, we're going to talk about our feelings. You know what I mean? Or right. it's going to be soft. Or yeah. it's going to be X, Y, or Z. And it's, and it's to me, it's the total opposite. You know, I, I look mm -hmm. at resilience and I look at the term resilience and I relate it directly to grit. You, you know what I mean? You yeah. use the word grit. You use the word resilient. You're, you're, it's interchangeable, you know? Mm -hmm. The Air Force definition of resilience is basically the ability to withstand and grow in the face of demands and stressors. You know, that, that's, right. that's basically what they're talking about. Which is grit. Which is awesome, you yeah. know? Because, and, and I think the other thing is we think of resilience, and I kind of said this at the uh, Commander's Day, mm -hmm. we think of resilience for major life events. I need to be resilient, if, you know, if I go through a divorce or my kid gets terminally sick or, right. you know, if we lose someone on deployment or there's a suicide in the squadron and, and yes, absolutely. You need to be resilient. But I think we overlook the tedious grind of day to day life. It gets to you. It does. It, it really gets, gets to, you. to you, you know, and, and that alone, just the day to day stress of balancing work and family and the monotony of, of teaching every mm -hmm. day and engaging students every day, or whatever, no matter where you are, that day to day can weigh you down and it yeah. can break you the same right. as a major event if you're not handling it and you're not mitigating that stress. I had, um, I forget where I saw this. It was a, a briefing I, I went through and I forget who it was. There was a lieutenant colonel and he was touring around talking about resilience. Right. And he had this whole graph of um like like the day-to-day -day stresses right and then you have spikes within that yeah. but your brain can only handle so much right so it's kind of like uh, like if you bring up um the computer like the operating system yeah like you've only got so much memory in there yeah and you eventually get to this to this point and the way that he described it is that at the top of the graph there's a red line right up there and you need to make sure that all the stuff in the bottom like the day-to-day -day, everyday stress like traffic and what am I having for breakfast and did I do PT yeah. and is my wife happy and am I getting fat and blah 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 <laughs> yeah you know like all those like mundane things that just happen yeah it's like your regular operating system on a computer like 
Outlook is open, sure, and yeah. Word is open, and PowerPoint is open, and it's the clock is running, and all that kind of stuff. We do too much, and it spikes. But what he was saying is that if you get up above that red line, that's where you're overstressed. Yeah. And if you stay above that red line for too long, then your fight or flight system right. kicks in. Yeah. And you can either so the healthy response obviously is to go into fight mode where you go and find those basic things and clear them up. Right. Let's go clear right. up those issues and get the stress level down. Yeah. But if you don't or can't, then that's when suicidal thoughts start to come Oh yeah. In. Yeah. Because your subconscious mind doesn't register any difference between the pain of smacking your hand with a hammer yeah. or incredible emotional strain or right. you know or, or mental strain. Yeah. And it just wants to get out of that situation. Oh, of course, yeah. So, yeah, so that's where the suicidal ideation starts to come right. in, you know. It's crazy. The whole thing is so crazy, you know, and I, and I think that that's where, you know, we, we miss the mark, I think, a little mm-hmm. bit as, as a whole. You know, we have, we talk about suicide, we talk about all of these things, but at the end of the day, you know, they talk about post-traumatic stress. Mm-hmm. You know, we, we talk so much about post-traumatic stress, but now they're starting to finally put more research and focus into post-traumatic growth. I just heard an article about that, yeah. an interview about that, like two days ago. Right. They were talking about post-traumatic growth, and I right. thought, really, you're finally... Yeah. It takes all these scientists... Yeah, it's crazy. You know, oh, now it's official. <laughs> Thanks, it's guys. It's crazy. <laughs> you know, what winds up happening, traditionally... Because I've, I've had it both ways. Right, I, yeah, absolutely. You know, I've, I've had traumatic events that completely crushed me. Right. And then traumatic events that made me who I am. Right. You know, and a lot of it just comes back to the grit. You know? Yeah. But before we go too much further, okay, so I, I heard that you've got an interesting story. Because I, I, when I was thinking about the resiliency thing, I mean, I knew that you had, like, the black belt or whatever it's called. Right, we right. talked a little bit about yeah, that yeah, the other yeah. day. So, but then I was talking to, who was I talking to? Sergeant Turba. Right. And he said that there's, there's a reason why you decided to go and pursue all that kind of stuff. Right. Because you had to come through some stuff, too. Yeah, absolutely. So you've got you've got a unique skill set that you bring to your additional skill set. So right. tell me something about that. About my story, so to speak. Yeah, just, and why, just why why I got into the resilience and all that. Yeah, stuff. and why are you so passionate about it? Alright, so but so long story short, I think that uh I have a different perspective, I think, on, on the way that I view things, you know. I think that a lot of people seek to avoid conflict, you know, and they seek to avoid all of these things. And I've always kind of thought that conflict is essential to life, you know, which is, I guess, a little different than Mm -hmm. some people. I I seek conflict, right? Healthy conflict. I think that that is where we grow, right? And that is where we learn the most about ourselves is in that. You look at nature, you look at anything that is out there in nature, in order for it to survive, it has to face conflict every single day. It has to struggle every single day. And if it doesn't struggle, it dies. Right? If it doesn't get up and decide it's going to struggle to eat and struggle to get water and struggle to stay warm and struggle, to, it, it dies. You know, mm-hmm. so I think that this concept of... Yeah, well, give me a for example. In nature, you're talking about? Yeah. Something that, that doesn't struggle and then withers. Well, I mean, anything. You, th- you, you look at any... You know, I always use the desert, I for think... example. Go ahead. Okay, so here's there's a story. And I don't know, like, all the details, but right. the gist of it is is perfect. Okay. I think what you're, I think kind of what you're hitting on is that it may not, like the individual may not die, but like a species could die out right, like right, because right. of the problems. So Absolutely. there was a story, I remember if it was World War One or World War Two, probably World War One. There was a, a family that manufactured um, propellers. Right. Have you heard the story? Mm-mm. It was a family that manufactured propellers. It was like the, the family business for, for airplanes. And uh, the dad had started the company. And he always would take, he would gather trees that were higher up the side of a mountain. Right. And, uh, and use those for, to build the propellers. Yeah. Well, I think he passed on or something like that. But his his son or the, the next generation took over the company and they wanted to build propellers. And, but they thought that the trees that were high up the mountain grew too slowly. Yeah. So they wanted to come further down the mountain so that it could increase their production. Right, yeah. Well, the propellers started just, flying apart right. they just didn't last yeah and the reason was is that the ones that were higher up had to withstand like the wind and the right. extreme temperatures right. and all that kind of crazy stuff 
And that's what made them so much stronger. Absolutely. And the ones lower down, you know, ended up being useless, yeah, yeah, yeah. you know, for that. I mean, they were great for shade. Right, right, yeah. You know? Well, it's interesting. They did a they did a, a study, I guess you could call it, in Europe, and, and I don't know exactly where I could get you the information, but they built this dome. And mm -hmm. basically, they tried to build this dome and create the perfect environment for plants and life to grow. So mm -hmm. They had the right humidity. They had perfect soil. They had perfect sun. They had everything. And what they wind up happening is every single thing that grew would grow to a certain point and then it would keel over and it would die. Everything. Really? And so what wound up happening, what they realized is there was no wind in there. Mm. And so what the wind does, it stresses the plants by pushing on it back and forth, right? So it stresses the stalks, causing right. them to grow stronger and causing them to gain strength. So what wound up happening is they shot right up perfectly, but they hadn't faced any stress. Right. They hadn't learned how to thrive in a conflict-type environment of that wind. Hmm. And so they would get so so big, they'd kill over and they would die. You know, because there was no stress. There's a lot of... There's a lot of information. There's, so, a, there's a lot of implications from that. Right, absolutely. It's you know, crazy. Like, the first thing that comes to mind is helicopter parents. Right. You're, like, always hovering around yeah, yeah, yeah. and making sure the kid is safe and making right. sure they never fall and yeah. make sure they never get a germ. And then you get idiots. Right. You know? Yeah. Who do can't fend for themselves. Right, they don't know can't. how to deal with anything when life Yeah, happens. they have no idea. And then you get, like, these crazy social justice warriors right. that, that light Los Angeles on fire. And, <laughs> yeah, You know, all yeah. this kind of stuff because somebody says something that, you know, right. makes them feel woo yeah. on the inside. feels uncomfortable. Yeah. You know, it's interesting. I, I'm not sure exactly how I got, you know, 100% into the resilience, the, the resilience. You know, I know I was offered the opportunity at Nellis. I became a resilience mm -hmm. training assistant. I started teaching FTAC and getting involved. From there, I became a master trainer. I got a special experience indicator, and I've been doing it ever since. But I love teaching this. And so mm. you had asked why I was passionate about it. I didn't know this actually an SEI that goes along Yeah, absolutely. If you get the master <laughs> resilience trainer, if you go to school for it, really? you get an SEI out of it, correct. Yep. Sure, I wish I would have known that one. Yeah, time ago. it's, it's, you oh, well. know, it's nice. Yeah. But um, I'm into it because of the fact that I like helping people realize that they're capable of so much more than what they realize, mm -hmm. you know, and a lot of the times the, the old way of thinking was people were born resilient, you know, some people are born resilient and some people aren't. Mm -hmm. And so all of the study has, you know, and the data shows that people can learn to be resilient, mm -hmm. right? We can teach people how to be resilient. And that is what I love doing. I love taking people. I love walking them through the 12 skills of the resilience, you know, curriculum, if you will, and kind of having that aha you, moment. I'm going to put you on the spot. Do you know him? I, I got him right here. I, I got almost him, but I brought. I, I came prepared. So we talk about out of that. All right. So resilience ties into comprehensive airman fitness. All right. It's kind of under the same mm -hmm. umbrella. So it originally started with the army, comprehensive soldier fitness, and what okay. they saw is that in the peaks of deployments and operational tempos, they saw lots of self-defeating behavior. So they saw mm. a lot of alcohol problems, a lot of yeah. you know spousal abuse, conflict, you yep. know domestic problems, a lot of suicides. A lot of that. So they looked at the entire thing and they did a massive study. And they went back 20 years looking at POWs and looking at people who had been captured, people who had been deployed and faced horrible things. Right. And they tried to identify what key aspects helped them to bounce back and okay. come back from that. Right. All right. So the University of Pennsylvania got involved. They did this massive study. So they, they made this curriculum basically through the Army. Air Force adopted it, mm -hmm. reworked it a little bit, and called it our own. Okay. So when we talk about resilience and comprehensive airman fitness, the concept is that there are four domains that make up our well-being. Okay. Right? We have our physical domain, right. we have our mental domain, right. we have our social domain, mm -hmm. we have our spiritual domain. Right. So we can look at them like like legs to a table. Okay, mm -hmm. like could we get by relying on three of them? Yeah, we could get by for a little while, but eventually that table's gonna buckle. Now when you when you talk, I know that a lot of people are gonna kind of balk at the idea of the spiritual domain. Right. You know, because they're like, well, I'm an atheist. Yeah, and I'm yeah, yeah and absolutely. That kind, of, that kind of stuff. That's my bread and butter. Yeah, but you got to, but how do you expand on that to say, okay, so, well, yeah, you may not think that, but right. you, there's still a spiritual aspect to right. you, even if you don't believe in it. Absolutely. Uh, and that's else. that's kind of the, uh, the, the difficult section, I think. And I love teaching spiritual because I love engaging the people that have that exact situation that you talked about. Right, yeah. To me, that's fascinating. So when they talk about spiritual, they're talking about strengthening strengthening beliefs, principles, or values that sustain our sense of well-being and purpose. So what I ask mm. people is, P 
people hear the term spiritual and they think life after death. They think religion. Right. You know, but I'm not so much focused about life after death. I'm focused about life before death. Right. What's your purpose? So you're talking What's about your why? You're talking about the the nuanced things that give life meaning. Right. Absolutely. Yeah. yeah. What gives it meaning? What's your why? You know, I like always what's tell your people, like like your like for me like it's my connection with my kids. Absolutely. Or like my connection with my wife. Or right. Like all those sorts of like ethereal things that nobody can put a finger on. Yeah. But they're very real to me. It's very and, and it moves you. Right. You know yeah. what I mean? It's the reason that we do what we do. A lot of the times when we talk about spiritual resilience, you know, you'll hear stories of people who are captured. What internally drove them to push through every single day? A lot of the right. times it is family. Mm -hmm. A lot of the times it could be knowing that someone else is counting on you. Right. You know what I mean? To not, to not fold, to not throw in the cards. So we're talking about our sense of well-being and our purpose. So I always ask, what's your why? What's your reason? Mm -hmm. The purpose of life is a life with a purpose. Right. What is that purpose? Yeah, you know, what, you know what, one of the things I've been this chair is still squeaky. I'm gonna edit that out too. No, um, I uh, I spent a lot of time studying, um, you know, philosophy. Right. And I'm I'm like that. Yeah. But and psychology and stuff like that. But there's this idea in the in postmodernism that that nothing really has any kind of meaning. Right. You know, and I remember back when I was in high school, I used to get in arguments with an English teacher because I had the mentality that if you didn't have anything worth living for, or if you didn't have anything that was worth dying for, right. then you didn't have anything worth yeah. living for. And I used to get just yeah. ripped for that because right. they're like, well, that's ridiculous. That's yeah. just some nonsense that you heard one time, blah, blah, blah. You don't really believe that. But that's always been a core conviction right. of me. It's like, if the, if the, yeah, if I wouldn't die for anything, why, why right. bother getting out of yeah. bed in the morning, yeah. you know? But I, but I think some of that ties into the the warrior ethos that we have in the military. Right. You know? Yeah. But I, I, I wanted to I wanted to point this out, though, because um, that postmodernist idea, it, it infiltrates a lot of the ways that we think and that we do. Because we are, we're, like, we're a cross-section of American right. society. Yeah. You know, so there are people who think like that. Yeah, absolutely. You know, and, but... Um, so it, it takes a little bit of mental gymnastics then, I right. think, to be able to, on the one hand, say, well, nothing really matters because, you know, I'm an atheist and blah, blah, blah. Right. But then to say, oh, but this other thing does matter and I have to, you know, find some reason to, right. to live for that one thing. Right, you know? right, right. And I know I'm, I'm an EA, so I'm overthinking the whole thing. No, yeah. But, but I just wanted to, to say that out loud for some yeah. reason. You know? No, absolutely. Yeah. Awareness. You know what I mean? And, that, and know, I think a lot of this comes back to awareness, being aware of yeah. ourselves, being aware of our needs, our physical, right. social, mental, spiritual needs. Mm -hmm. Because people can say that they're not spiritual, but it's not about religion. Right. It's about your driving force behind what you do, what you, you know, why you do what you do. Right. Every single one of us has it. Right. You know, we get caught on these terms, you know, resilience. Mm -hmm. I don't want to talk about my feelings, spirituality. I'm not religious. Right. And it's so much more than that. Yeah. You know, you peel that onion back. Every single one of us has these elements to our well-being, whether we want to believe mm -hmm. it or not. Yeah. You know, and so it's really interesting to me, uh, all of that, you mm -hmm. know, but spiritual resilience, we're talking about your why. What's your why? Everybody has a why. Right. What is it? So if you go back to the yeah. list then, so what are the others? So all right, so this is what we got. So, so got they break it down physical, into four domains, right? Mental. We have we have spiritual, physical, mental, and social. Right. Those are our domains of, of what makes up who we are and how we function. Mm -hmm. From there, there's 12 different skills that we teach. Okay. And each skill is going to relate directly to one or more of those domains. Okay. Okay, so the first one that we're going to talk about, we're going to talk about counting your blessings, cultivating mm -hmm. gratitude. Cultivating gratitude. Okay, so cultivating gratitude, what we're trying to do is we're trying to build optimism and positive thinking. Mm -hmm. So we're trying to focus on the good. And I talked about this right. at the Commander's Day. Almost all of our society is hardwired for negativity. I wonder why that is. I have no is idea. Is that an American thing? I, 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 think that... it's, I think it's more than that. You know, like my personal take is it goes back so far that that's the way we were yeah. wired from whether you believe in creation or evolution, whatever. It, it's been wired you know... into our brain. That's yeah. That's a good point. I did hear a theory about that once. That you have to remember. You got to remember where the tiger is, so you don't go exactly. back there again. Right. Exactly. Right. You know, when, but you're you're likely to find an apple on a tree right. like anywhere. Yeah. You know, you kind of have a general idea of where the fruit grows. Right. But you 
you know, damn well where the tiger is. Exactly. You know, and what it smells like. You know, I think it's been you know? wired in our brains to do that. And then yeah. society is just built on that to the point where everything you see, you turn on the news, it's all negativity. Mm-hmm. You know, so cultivating gratitude is an opportunity to think about what went right. Right. You know, and, and we see it so much in our career where you could do five jobs awesome. You know, yeah. and then you do that sixth job that's not so awesome. And, you and in the morning that. meeting, the boss will go for 15 or 20 minutes harping on the one job that went wrong instead of saying, hey, you know what? These other five jobs were awesome. Yeah. You know, and it goes back to that negativity bias, right? That, that hardwired towards negativity. Right. And so cultivating gratitude is something that will help us build optimism, right? We rewire the way that our brain is working. I do want to say one thing too, just from like, like a leadership and management perspective, there's there's some wisdom on spending a little bit of extra extra time on the mistakes. Right. Oh, absolutely. You know, like like you gotta you gotta find the difference between creating a, like a one mistake air force, like they say. Right. But then also, if if you treated the mistakes the same as all the successes, right? Then people would become a little more lax about making right. mistakes, and they wouldn't put so much pressure on themselves. Yeah. No. Definitely. You know? So you have to. But you got to find that because you don't yeah. want to... It's know, a balance. It you is. Know? Optimism yeah. needs to be wed to reality. Correct. You cannot ignore the fact that something went wrong. You right. cannot pretend that I'm just going to focus on the good. And even though my wife's divorcing me and I'm going to lose my kids, I'm just going to focus on the good. It doesn't work that way. <laughs> no. Right? It, it, unfortunately, no. it doesn't work that way. Right. So cultivating gratitude is a way to deal with the daily hassles and to try and take an opportunity to focus on what went good. Right. Because every day, even on the worst of days you can sit there and you can think of something that went good. Right. You know, at a base level. Right. And so that is cultivating gratitude, is taking an opportunity to focus on the good. So that's the first of our 12, you know, skills that we talk about. The next one we talk about mindfulness. Okay. Mm -hmm. So mindfulness is being present in the moment, disengaging from negative thoughts that interfere with performance values or goals. Mm -hmm. Okay. So what they talk about is this is something that we're going to do when our, when our mind is overwhelmed with negativity. Right? Mm-hmm. Our mind is, is just flooded with thoughts or beliefs that are keeping us from taking purposeful action. Mm-hmm. Okay, so we want to be mindful of that, is, is, is that concept. That's mm-hmm. another lesson that we teach. And I don't want to go too deep into the weeds because I won't hit all no, of them, right? No. We'll stay surface level. We also talk about accomplishing goals. And mm-hmm. it's a little different, right? We always hear about SMART goals in the Air Force. Right. Specific, measurable, all that. So accomplishing goals, the way that we teach it is you need to tie it to a value. Right? You need to tie a goal to a value. If it's not tied to something that you see value in, mm-hmm. odds are you're not going to put a whole lot of effort into accomplishing that goal. You know, and that's that's a strange thing. I see that here with the airmen a lot. Right. Especially the ones that have already graduated and they're just waiting yeah. for their orders or something like that. And they just get stuck on detail flights, say. Right. Or you'll, you'll, I'm sure, like, as a dirt boy, you've seen this tons of times where you'll have, like, a new airman and their job is to stand there with the shovel and like move this little thing right. over here, yeah, this yeah, little, yeah. little yeah. over there, you know, and, and it's hard to be able to um, uh, attach some kind of value right. to a seemingly menial task of labor, right. you know. So one of the things I tell the airmen here, you know, they start getting down and they're the, then, you know, they've been on detail flight for yeah. weeks and they're just like starting to get kind of down and depressed, which is normal. Right. It tells yeah, me that they're absolutely. normal, healthy human beings, right. you know. They were still excited about it. I worry about them a little bit. Yeah. <laughs> Maybe we need to check your lifting, buddy. <laughs> but um, one of the things that I that I tell them is that they're they're still learning about airmanship. They're right. learning about you know following through with commitments. They're yeah. learning about you know doing the boring thing, even though it's crappy, but just because it's the right thing to do. One of my mantras that I say to them all the time is that you got to do the right thing at the right time for the right reasons. Yeah. Even if it seems boring as hell, even if it seems pointless. You still got to keep slugging right. forward, you know? So, anyway, Yeah, sorry. no, it's interesting. So, but it's true. You need to find out what, what somebody values, and you need to tie that goal to a value. Right. You know, so my biggest thing for the longest time was I, I joined the military, and a lot of us did. I'm never going to go to school. I don't mm-hmm. want to go to school. That's why I'm right. joining the military. And then what happens, right? A couple months later, I find out, hey, you're going to go to school. Yeah. And so for me, I never valued education, right? Nobody in my mm-hmm. family graduated high school. I'm the only one to graduate high school. So right. I never had a, a strong value on education. And when I went through this training and I started learning, right, I need to tie a goal to a value. So I may not value education, mm-hmm. but what do I value? Right, I value my family. 
Right. That's that's my number one value is my family. I value my career. Mm -hmm. Right. So now I know in the Air Force, I need to get this education because a, it's good for my career. Mm -hmm. Right. It's good for my family long term. So yeah. I need to tie it to something that I care about. So although mm -hmm. I may not care about education, what do I care about? How do I tie that goal to that value that I see personal benefit in? Right. You know, we talk about sharing our goal with another person. Right. The accountability mm. factor. I call it the shame right. factor. You know, we, we share a goal yeah. with someone that way they can follow up on you and say, mm -hmm. hey, you know, you said you were going to do this and, I, and you haven't done a whole lot. Right. Right. The shame factor. Mm -hmm. Accomplishing goals. That's one of the things that we talk about. Right. So we talk shame, about shame is really is important. It, it, People you know, shy away from it. Right. Right. Because you know, right. because it's a it's a gross feeling. Yeah. It doesn't you know, to feel, feel ashamed. Good, for sure. But, you know, I don't right. know. Like I was a. Uh, a few weeks ago, I, I started smoking again. Mm. I was really stressed out about like everything right. that was going on. The baby was coming, blah, yeah. blah, blah. And one day, I had a cigarette. I was a heavy smoker for a long time. Right. And there's that feeling of, mm. you know, it's it's nice to have a cigarette because I'm, right. I'm an avid tobacco user. Yeah. But then there's that shame. Yeah. You know? And But I would never, like, smoke out front of this building you know right, there's like right, this right. Bit, yeah, yeah, you know yeah, there's yeah. a can out there but i <laughs> yeah. can imagine if like an airman saw me smoking yeah. like so i i stopped it again though there you go. that was like a couple yeah. of weeks and i'm like this is stupid i'm you know i'm causing all kinds of other problems but um yeah so now it's been three weeks that's awesome it's been three weeks yeah. since i quit again yeah it's good though <laughs> so hopefully i'm hopefully this is it i'm sure i'll you know pick it up again right. in the future sometime but yeah, but there's that always that feeling, but yeah. but but it but it's a gross feeling, but it's a valuable. feeling. It is a valuable feeling, you know? absolutely. That, that's the point. That is, and and yeah. it's interesting, you know, and, and if if you embrace it and do something with it, purposeful action, right? Right. Everything you need to take purposeful action, and that's kind of the concept, you know. And and it kills me when people think resilience, everything is rainbows and sunshines and unicorns, and it's like no, that's not the case. Right. There will be times where you will break as a human being. Mm. There is times where you'll be sad. There's time you're going to experience every range of emotion that is. Yeah. But what do you do with it? Right. What do you do with it? Who are you? That's what mm -hmm. matters. You can be a, a, a puddle or you can be an ocean, right? Mm -hmm. And people walk right through puddles and oceans destroy cities. <laughs> Who do you want to be? What it's do true. you want to be? Take right. purposeful action. Use it. Harness it. You know, so accomplishing goals. We do talk about that. Capitalizing on strengths, strength spotting. Okay, so knowing your signature strengths. Mm -hmm. What are you naturally strong at? Right? There's a there's a survey called Values in Action. It's free. Mm -hmm. It'll ask you a series of questions a bunch of times, and it'll list your top strengths, all right, your strongest values. Mm -hmm. All right. And and one of the things that uh, that we do when we go through this training is the entire class does that. Right? And and knowing your strengths allows you to know which areas you're gonna naturally be strong in. And it also lists them from the strongest to the weakest. So it also tells you what areas do I need to improve on. You is that know? is that like an online it's free, yeah. Value you, you can Google values in action, it'll come up. And and so capitalizing on strengths, right? It's it's good for us to know our strengths, but it's mm -hmm. also good to know our people's strengths. Right, the people that work for us, the people that work with us, because we can put them in situations that allows them to succeed. We can put the right person in the right job when it matters most, right. and we can also put people in opportunities that isn't their strong point, right? To right. help them to grow, right. because it's not about putting you where you're comfortable all the time and letting exactly. you ride it out comfortably. No, right? As a leader and as a mentor, we want to challenge you. So right. by knowing the strengths of your airman, your subordinate, whatever. You can capitalize on what ones they're good at, and right. you can bring the other ones up to par by challenging them. Yeah, and, and build stronger teams. And, and I think that it's also important to, on an individual level, and as a supervisor, to be kind of familiar with um, people's dark side, too. Right, absolutely. You know, like, yeah. cause, so, I mean, I've got weak areas, but right. then I've got kind of yeah. areas. Yeah, like, absolutely. We, I mean, um, I think it's, you know, I think we but, all do. But you can, well, you have to. You yeah. Know, but, but you can use those. As a plus two, like right. you can, you can use those as, um, what's that in, you know, in sailing, have you done any sailing before? I've, I've, I've watched, but like ridden along, but not a whole lot like myself, <laughs> you know? Well, I used to sail a lot when I was, um, what was a long time ago? Um, cause I grew up in the lakes in New Hampshire right. and it's easy to think that when you're sailing, you just go with the wind 
but then you got to get back home. Yeah. And the wind's still going the same right. way. Yeah. So how does that work? Right, right, right. And what you can do is you, I mean, you, you use the wind headed towards you and you can cut an angle like across the water and you're using that positive force to kind of push right, you. Right, right. And you end up having to like zigzag, zigzag. back. It takes a little bit longer, but you're using that negative force that would have driven right. you another way to get back to where yeah. you need to be. Yeah. And it's like you kind of do that same sort of mental gymnastics to right. find the fact that, well, I do tend to procrastinate. Right, right. But that means that when, you know, I can like save up so much work. Yeah. So like when I get down to the deadline, I know I'm going to do exactly all kinds of stuff and, and knock it out of the park yeah. even better than I normally would have, you know. Right. And I love that. Like you, know, you were so talking about using that force, right? Using right. that force of the wind. And I'm a huge believer in using things, right? So right. I think like anger and, and, and all of these different feelings that are generally associated as negative, I love them. And I think that they're awesome if you use them correctly, right? right? If you don't harness them and if you don't have a way to, to effectively use them to take that purposeful action, yes, they can be very negative, very destructive. But it's like the saying you can learn just as much from a bad supervisor as you can from a good supervisor, right? Yeah. So you're choosing to take the bad yep. and learn from it, grow from it, adapt from it, mm -hmm. you know, which is interesting. So we talk about capitalizing on strengths. We talk about acceptance, which is, which is a tough one for people, you know, coming to terms with the fact that, hey, something happened and yes. I have to deal with it. You right. know, the white bear phenomenon. If I, if I show you a picture of a white bear and I say, don't think about a white bear, right. you're going to think about the white bear over and over <laughs> exactly. and over again. Exactly. So yeah. acceptance is saying, you know what? Avoidance doesn't work. Right. I can't avoid this. And sometimes I think acceptance can be one of the most important parts to you. I was listening to a guy that was giving a lecture about this same sort of thing. And that when, when you get to a point of acceptance, that's when you can start to be useful on right. a team or in a group yeah. or in a family. So, you know, a few weeks ago, my, my wife's father died. Yeah. It was unexpected. And... But, you know, so we had a lot of talks about oh, it. Yeah. And, but because people in the family were able to accept it and move forward, there was nobody in the family who was just a complete, like, blubbering idiot. Right. right. You know what I mean? Yeah. Um, you know, different people took it harder and different people had to struggle a little bit more. But there was always a few people in there that said, okay, this is what happened. Yeah. And you know what? We're, we're right. just, we're just going to press. Right. And, um, but that, that was so helpful to, to yeah. have that. And I think that, in a in a in a team, in an Air Force team, I think that you're inevitably going to have somebody on that team who's going to be accepting of whatever event happens, right. and I think it's important. I'm I'm just kind of like formulating yeah, this idea, no, yeah. so it sounds like I'm stuttering, but I think it wouldn't be important then to to be able to have everybody on the team, regardless of their rank or position or responsibilities, to be able to look, look at the person who is accepting. And kind of like harness right, yeah. some of that acceptance. Absolutely. You know what I mean? You know, to, it's, it's, to be able to just keep moving forward with whatever right. situation It's is. funny. We get hung up. You know, we get into these situations where something happens. There's an event at work. Something big takes place, right? And we can't move forward. And the reason right. we can't move forward is because we haven't accepted what happened. Right. You know, I always tell people like acceptance doesn't change what happened. It just frees you up. It allows you to not let the past bleed all over the future. Right. That's what it comes down to. Because mm -hmm. if you hold on to something and you don't accept it, it's not going to do anything for you. Right? Yeah. We're a product of our past, but we're not bound to it. We're not mm -hmm. a slave to our past. We're a yeah. product of it. It's shaped who we are, but we don't have to be bound by it. Mm -hmm. So acceptance teaches us how to move forward, right. how to accept those things that, hey, guess what? Life isn't always sunshine and rainbows. Right. Right? We have bad things happen. So we want to learn how to get acceptance and how to move forward. And, uh, and go from there, which is interesting. We talk about, there's a skill called ABC, which is kind of a foundational skill uh, in the resilience curriculum. And so it's an acronym. So basically activating event, a belief, and a consequence. Mm -hmm. Okay, so everything that happens kind of follows that chart. And so what people a lot of the times will say is something will happen, and then there's a consequence. And they will right. say that action, that activating event, drove this consequence. Right. But they forget that something happens in the middle, which is your beliefs, your mm -hmm. brain's interpretation of that event. Right. You know, so I, I always tell a story about when I was in Vegas, you know, I'm sleeping and I hear this really loud crash downstairs in the middle of the night. Mm -hmm. So in my mind, someone's in my house in the right. middle of the night. Like it sounds like someone came through the back door. So I get up, right? Like any red-blooded American, I grab the, the firearm, 
right? I put one in the chamber. Now, my right. heart is racing ridiculously fast. My body is reacting as if somebody is downstairs in my house, mm -hmm. right? So the consequences, we have physical consequences and we have emotional consequences, right? So physically, my heart is racing, right? I'm sweating. I'm, I'm going around the corner. My kids are still in bed, right? I go all the way downstairs, right? I get out the back door. Nobody's in the house. My neighbors are doing CrossFit oh. at like two in the morning, right? <laughs> so the, the traditional belief would be the activating event, the noise drove that reaction, right? But it wasn't the noise. It was your belief. It was my belief. My right. belief was someone is in the house. Mm -hmm. My belief drove that reaction. Mm -hmm. Right? So when we talk about the ABC skill, that's what we're talking about. All right? Being aware of how our brain drives reactions. Well, can, I want to add um, one of my favorite things, too, that I learned when I was first learning about resiliency and all this other kind of stuff is um, it's kind of the same story but a, a different approach to it. Right. Is that right now, hypothetically... Right now, um, somebody could have somebody could have stolen your car. Yeah. Right now, your car might not be in the parking right. lot right yeah. now, and it's just gone. Yeah. Right. But we're here having a conversation. Right. Life's going on. And so the fact that the car was stolen has no effect on Nothing. you whatsoever. It's when you find out right. you that your aware. car was stolen. That's when all of a sudden you have the right. response. You're having a your your brain is now able to interpret it because you're aware. Right. And that you know? that was always really helpful to me. Yeah. Like, so when I went through my divorce, um, I, I was able to kind of keep that in mind that like I'd start to say, oh, well, she did this and yeah. all this is because of this and blah, blah, blah. But instead I was, I was able to say, oh, no, wait, this is just a thing that's happening. Yeah. You know, and okay, so now I've got these emotions or whatever, got to process those, stick them over in this bucket for a minute. Right. But now I got to address these sorts of things yeah. because it's not the event that's affecting me. It's right. how I'm responding exactly. to it, you know? Yeah. And it, and so. it goes back down to that you can't control... All we have control over is us, right? I have right. no control over anything else. Right. But what I can control is my reaction to what happens. Right. Right. I can control the way that re I react. Mm -hmm. And that's kind of the, the ABC, right? Understanding our activating event, our belief, and then the consequences behind it. And uh, and going from there. You I know, almost wish that B would like be a bigger B. I know. Yeah. yeah it's like, that's kind of an A and kind of a C, but that B is like right. a really big B. It is. B. You know, that's, that's the yeah. missing piece that people forget about. Right. Right. You made me get mad. No. No. No, you had a belief about something that took place. That belief drove your reaction. Right. You know, so we want to use this basically, right, when, when our reactions aren't helping us. Mm -hmm. Okay, so when our reactions right. aren't allowing us to take purposeful action, we ABC it. We break it down. What was the activating event? What was my belief or thought about it? Right. Right, what were my consequences? We go through it. Right, we talk about balancing your thinking. All right, that's another skill mm -hmm. that we teach, balancing your thinking. So the concept of balancing your thinking is to allow you to perceive situations accurately. Mm -hmm. All right, so that we can take purposeful action. A lot of the times we get clouded by emotion mm -hmm. when, when we're in the, the moment, right? We get clouded by emotion. And uh, so we want to kind of take a step back and, and be able to balance our thinking. So one of the things that we think about is, right, uh, would I judge someone else harshly, mm -hmm. you know, in the same circumstance, right? Mm -hmm. We phone a friend. Right. That's another thing we do. We call someone else, gain a perspective, a different perspective. Because we always, naturally, we put the emotion over the intelligence. Right. Right? But we want to put the I over the E. We want to put the intelligence over the emotion. Uh -huh. So the first thing we want to do is, is there any evidence to support or disprove this thought? Right. That's what we ask ourselves. From there, would I hold someone else to a different standard? So when I was deployed, right, I remember one time my wife got busy. Uh, I forget what happened, but, you know, she called me the same time every night. And so one time she doesn't call, right? So in my mind, mm -hmm. something happened, right? Like, right. what's going on, you know, blah, blah, blah. And, and my mind is spiraling out of control, right? So balancing your thinking would be, is there any evidence to support or disprove this thought? Right. Right? Is, is, she, is she running around on me? Well, there's no evidence to support that, right? Would I hold someone else to a higher standard? If you're my best friend and you call me every day and all right. of a sudden you don't, am I going to assume you found a new best friend? Right. You know, you know what I mean? <laughs> Probably yeah. not. No. You know, you know, and then phoning a friend. In that book, uh, The Crucial Conversations right. that I was pushing yeah. the other day, he talks about how when you're when you're when you're in a situation like that, when you're in a stressful situation, yeah, your um, your physiology changes a little bit. Absolutely. Because you go you get into that fight or flight mode, yeah. which means that the blood is taken away and brought to like organs and muscles and all that right. kind of stuff. 
and you you can't think no. as well. Yeah. Because you don't have as much juice flowing to right. the noggin. And you just got adrenaline it, pumping. Yeah, exactly. That's crazy. So even though it's yeah, and but it but it's um I mean it's a great response. Right. To an other situation. If right. you're if you're facing an actual exactly. bear. Exactly. But is it an appropriate response right, right now? Yeah. You know? So but the important thing that when they talk about in the book is that um when you get that, when you start feeling like that, we're we don't face bears every day in our life. <laughs> right, anymore. right, right. So the best thing, that's the time to like, you know, stop and Right, take a step back. Yeah, and take a step back, but also to to rely on your training. Yeah. And especially in the military. That right. that's where or not just the military, but the police and the firefighters yeah. and all that other kind of stuff. That's where your military training comes in because now you've got these the um what's the word I'm looking for? Not motor response. Almost like muscle memory. Muscle memory. Right. Yeah. And and but muscle memory on a mental level too. Yeah. Because if you've already practice how to respond to right, that kind right. of thing even when your brain isn't functioning quite properly you've already practiced how to respond right. to that kind of thing it's interesting because that ties directly into another thing that we another skill we teach is called check your playbook mm -hmm. right so check your playbook because yeah. our brain kind of takes shortcuts in the way that we think so a lot of the times right. if, if a response works we we take that and we run with it mm -hmm. and we use it over and over and over again you know and our brain is like ruts in a road right so if we drive yeah. on one path it wears that path down and if that path works, we're like, hey, this got us to where we needed to go. We keep taking it. Those ruts get deeper. And that way of thinking and reacting gets difficult to get out of. Yeah. So checking your playbook, a lot of people will, you know, in the military, their play is their position, their rank. Mm -hmm. You know, oh, you're going to listen to what I have to say because X, Y, and Z. It doesn't always work no. that way. Mm -hmm. You know, it, it, it doesn't <laughs> always work that way. So checking your playbook is an opportunity to say, is this working or do I, just like you said, need to revert to a different way of, of handling this right, yeah. to move forward? You know, mm. it's interesting. It, it, it really is. One of my favorite things that we talk about is, is it's called uh, active constructive responding. You know, yeah, it's crazy. All right, you're going to have to spell that uh, out. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> this one blew my mind, right? And, and I don't know if we'll get to everything, all of these, but this one blew my mind. And active constructive responding, in my opinion, right, can change every aspect of your life from your personal life to your professional life mm -hmm. all right so what it what it really comes down to is people come to us whether it's our our kids our wife our students our airmen people come to us to talk right right every single day people yeah, come yeah, to yeah, us to day. talk yeah. and a lot of the times they're coming to share something that is good news to them mm -hmm. whether it's something really minute to us or whether it's something that we flat out just don't give a crap about Mm -hmm. You know, I, 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 when I was learning this skill, I used to say all the time, like, I have airmen that come talk to me about stuff that I just don't care about. Mm -hmm. Flat out. I mean, I don't care, you know? Yeah. But the concept is I may not care about what they're saying, but I care about them as a human being. Right. So how we respond is going to build or it's going to break that relationship. Mm -hmm. So when someone comes to us with good news, they're coming to us for a reason, first of all. Right. Right. They, they chose us out of everyone else to come right. share this good news with. All right. So we have two different types of responding. Right. We, we have act. We have constructive responding and we have destructive responding. Mm -hmm. Right. We have two different ways that we can respond. All right. And there's different boxes that you can check yourself in. Right. There's active constructive, active destructive, passive constructive and then passive destructive. Right. Mm -hmm. We want to be an active constructive responding. So what that means is you come to me with good news, right? You're, you're an airman. You say, hey, Sergeant, you know, this weekend, you know, I just made it to the next level in Wizards and Gizzards, you know? <laughs> and, and me personally, right. right, at that moment, I have a choice. How am I going to respond? Right. I could shut them down right then and there. And a lot of right. us do this. True. And, and we don't realize we do this. Right. You know, oh, that's awesome. You know, whatever. You know, we steal their joy. We're a joy thief. Mm -hmm. We take that moment and we run with it. You know, when Aaron comes and says, hey, I bought a new car this weekend. And the NCO supervisor and us, instead of saying, oh, it's awesome. What kind of car is it? You know, yeah. I bet you're excited. Did you take it out yet? What's the first thing we do? Oh, man, have you thought about the car payments? <laughs> man, you're, you're an A1C. You're living in the dorms. Yeah. We steal their joy in that moment. Right. right? And it, it's just a natural way that we respond. And so ideally, we want to actively constructively respond all right we, we help them relive that moment now it doesn't mean right. we can't go back 
right. an hour later and re-engage if we have an issue. Right. Right. We yeah. can't. We can come that back the the next morning. Yeah, like, absolutely. You know, okay. So it always gets challenged. You know. Happy for your car. Right. Or like I'm happy for the wizards and gizzards. Yeah. But you got your end of course exam tomorrow. Exactly. What's where's your priority? Right. Buddy? Right. Yeah. So, but but I think that but that doesn't have to be. I think in our in our Western mind, we tend to think of things as either or. Right. Like you either have to be accepting or you have to be yeah. criticizing. Right. You can't have both and. You can't say, oh man, that's really cool. And I'm sure you also made plenty of time to study. Or yeah. I'm sure you were also <laughs> right, doing right. that because you were rewarding yourself for having spent so much time studying for your end of course <laughs> yeah, exam, yeah. right? Right. You know, and so you can you can do both at the same time. Absolutely. You, you can make do positives for, right. for both things. No, you so, can. And, yeah. you know, the whole thing is really interesting. You know, what we don't want to have happen is a lot of the times how we respond, we're a joy thief, right? We steal mm -hmm. their joy. We hijack the conversation. Yeah. Which happens all the time. I'm wicked guilty of that. Yeah, me too. We all are. You know, it's terrible. Someone comes in and they're like, oh, hey, man, you know, like I just bought a new car. Oh, that's awesome. Check out this thing I just did. Yeah. You know what I mean? Like we just steal it and we run with it, you know? So yeah. we, we steal the joy. We hijack the conversation, right? There, there's all sorts of ways that we respond. And ideally what we want to do, because there was a reason they came to us, right. we build that, right? We just allow them to have that moment, mm -hmm. share it with them. Yeah. And the whole concept is, if people are willing to come to you with their good news, they're going to come to you with their bad news. Right. They're going to come to you when something is wrong. Right. I'm a huge believer, and I wish that you know more people understood this concept uh, in, in the Air Force, is uh, people forget what you say, right? People forget mm -hmm. what you do, but people don't forget how you make them feel. Yeah. And as a leadership perspective, Very that true. is so impactful to me. Yep. And we can say, oh, it's, oh, I don't care how they feel. If, you know, uh, you know, if your feelings were an issue, we would have issued you them in basic. You know, this <laughs> kind of like really caveman style way of thinking, right? But we've evolved and we've right. grown as a military, yep. right? And so I don't want to be that leader. You right. know, I don't want to be that NCO that just shuts someone down, steals their joy, and just get back to work. Right. You know, there's a reason they come to you. And so we want to build on that. And they're more likely to come to you with their bad news. But guess what? Mm -hmm. If you don't have the time to, to look up at them and make eye contact and get away from the computer screen or put down your phone and actually engage them in a conversation, odds are they're not going to come to you. Yeah. When they have a real issue, they're going to go to someone that's been listening the whole time. Now, when you, so you've, you have like a comparison between you know, this environment and then, where, where'd you come from? Nellis. You were in Nellis. Yeah. Were you a Red Horse out there? Nope. Main base. You're main base. So you must have had, and did you recently, you were tech sergeant already when you got here. Yeah, right? yep. So you probably had like three or four people, five people, right. you know, Absolutely. Like on an average day. Yeah. And you had some time to maybe talk to them and interact with them. Yeah. Here, that's, that would be a luxury. Right, yeah. To only have exactly. three or four yeah, or five insane. airmen to listen to. It's crazy. Right. And the other thing is that at, at home station, you would have the same group of airmen and NCOs right. for over and a over and year over again. or yeah. more. Yeah. You know, that you could always, you could build a relationship and kind of take time. But here, right. Well, I mean, how, like you'll get a group of airmen that come through and you got to Yeah, I have them for a week. A week and that's it. And that's it. I'll right. see them around, but I, I'm yeah. with them for a week. Right. So you kind of have to have that skill, but on the fly. You got to have it on the fly. Yeah. You got to. All you the know? time. And so, and so when somebody... And one thing, too, that I, I, I just I apologize. that I, I only just posted the, the interview with Master and Keller. Right. Well, I sent out the link today. It's yeah. been on YouTube for right. a long time. But that's one of the things that we talked about a lot is is the importance of remembering that that for these airmen that, that are coming through here at the tech school, right. like everything is all brand new. Yeah. But for us... It's, it's it. yeah. old. It's like, come on, right. why don't How you guys do you get this? this yet, you know? Yeah, and you gotta keep. I have to keep reminding myself that they don't know this yet because it's yeah. brand new for exactly. them. It's old hat for me, and so I have to constantly refresh myself. Right. I can't imagine what it must be like for TIs. Right. I think it comes Just, back down to, and this is one of so the things that, that we talk about: is do you have a growth mindset or do you have a fixed mindset? Right. You know what I mean? A lot of us. You know, we have this fixed mindset of this is the way it's been and this is the way it needs to be and this is how it was when I came in and X, Y, and Z. But that doesn't work, right? right. That, that, that's not where change, right, and where, where uh, evolution and where, where all of the, the, the moving forward happens, right? right? We don't move forward if we're stuck thinking the same way that we were 10 years ago. So we need to have a growth mindset. 
Right. You know, and, and I think that that is so crucial to what you were talking about, engaging with those airmen, having that open mind, having that growth mindset to say, hey, you know what? Yeah. You know, maybe this isn't about me. Maybe it's not about how it was when I went through. Right. Right. It's about them. This is the opportunity to mentor it is, them. It is. Right? And isn't. bring them where they need to be. It's it's both. So I'm going to nerd right, yeah. out. I'm, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to nerd out for Do a it. So there's, um, there's this idea... It, um, there's a sequence of numbers called the Fibonacci sequence. Right. And this is one of those things that kind of ties into, um, it ties into a lot of different things in math and how spirals like in a yeah. seashell are built and right. all this other kind of stuff. But it's the Fibonacci sequence. And so many things in life are kind of based on this from a philosophical point of view. And the idea is that you take, you take a number and its previous number in the sequence, and just, we're just whole integers for yeah. now. And you add them together and then you get the sum. Right. And then you take that sum and add it to the previous number and then you get another sum. And then you keep kind of doing that as you go. And the way that it goes, it starts at zero and then one and then one plus zero is one. And then one plus one is two and then two plus one yeah, is yeah, three. Yeah. And three plus two is five and five plus right. three is eight. And you can see it kind of keeps expanding, but it's at that same exponential right. growth, right? And it's it's that sequence that ends up causing the spiral in a seashell yeah. or the spiral in a galaxy or the spiral in sunflowers or whatever. Right. And I think that that sequence also applies to um, life. Yeah. So you say that you got to have a like a growth mentality right. instead of a, like a stasis mentality, yeah. but you have to have both. Right. You have to be able to take the lessons that... that right, absolutely. That's why studying yeah, Air Force yeah, yeah. history is so important. Right. Because, like, you need to know what Hap Arnold did. Yeah. And why he was such a phenomenal right. general. Yeah. So that we can, so we can build on that. Definitely. You need to know, you need to know, right know where you did. came from to right. project where you're going. Right. And, and then, but then also see the good and the bad of it. Right. Like, there's a lot of great things that we did in the, the 1950s and 1960s in the Air Force. But at the same time... I found a, an old set of floor plans when I was at Fairchild Air Force yeah. Base. An old set of floor plans, because that civil engineering building had been right. there for a long, long time. And what was what was now the women's bathroom used to be the blacks only bathroom. Oh wow. Yeah. And that it was just it was weird because right. yeah, that was crazy. such a foreign you can't concept. Even think of like, that at this point. Blacks what? only. And no the, and no women? Right. What right. is <laughs> What a crazy thing. Yeah. You know, and, and everybody had ashtrays in their desk because yeah. they were all smoking. It's nuts. You know, but the thing is, is that, but there was a lot of things that they did really, really well. Right. You know, as far as aircraft maintenance and yeah. building the facilities and, and then, but also seeing that, that sort of thing, like having a blacks only bathroom and yeah. having no women in the military right. was not no, the best work. way to do stuff. This was not a good thing. So being able to grow Correct. away from that without, without letting go of right. the... The valuable things. Yeah, you know no, what I, mean? I agree absolutely. So, so what, what I so that just that just kind of goes back to my whole right. Like I'm always foot stomping, but you got to have that both and you do absolutely. Mentality. You right. got to be able to let go of the bad things. You know, like now, like homosexuals can serve openly, right. and transgender folks are coming in. Yeah, and that opens up our pool of talent absolutely that we have access to, so we can have a higher quality force. Right. So we got to get rid of that old mentality, but we can't right. get rid of the Air Force core values. We exactly. can't get rid of, exactly. you know, those sorts of things that are always the fundamentals that will stay right. with us. Yeah, no, yeah. for sure. You know, and, and what I think at the end of the day, you know, I got a class that I got to get back to in a minute here, but what, when I think of it at the end of the day, when how I talk ma- about... How, how many of those things do we let's make Let's see what through? else you got. We've got... All right, so another one that we talked about. We talked about check your playbook. Physical resilience, which gets beaten into our heads. Yeah, we're good right? on that. We can... The importance of physical resilience. Right. All right, interpersonal problem solving is another skill. And I love teaching this because it's so important. But basically what we're talking about is finding a way to address a problem that still shows respect for the relationship. Mm-hmm. Right? So again, we get so heated. We get so in, in our own heads, our need to be right yep. trumps everything else. So a lot of times in an argument, and, and we see this with really you know significant other relationships. We see it with close coworkers. Mm-hmm. Our need to be right trumps everything else. Yeah. And we wind up saying or behaving in a manner that completely disrespects the other individual. And backfires. Right, and it never works out it in our advantage. It destroys the thing you know? that you're trying to say. Right, so what yeah. we want to do is we want to address that problem in a manner that still shows respect for that relationship and allows us to move forward. God. You know, and, and so there's steps involved in that, um, which, is, which is awesome, you know. But we want to lower the intensity. That's the goal. Yeah. 
right? Show respect for the other individual, lower the intensity, and come to a resolution that both parties can agree on. That's hard to do when it you have a whole bunch of type A personalities. It's really hard to do. Yeah. You know, and, and it's e all of this is easier said than done. And that's the big thing I don't mm -hmm. want to ever come off as is like, this is the way you're supposed to think. Right. Or this is the way that it's not easy. No. Y you know, I fail at all of this every single day oh, in definitely. one manner or another. Oh, definitely. You know, I think we all do. So we got that. We talked about uh, active constructive responding. We talked about that. Talked about that. We hit that. Yeah, we're there. We hit them. Did it? Yeah. We got it all through all 12? We got all of them. Good listening is the only other one, which ties into active constructive responding. It's yeah. interesting, you know, and, and this is the other thing about these. When we teach these, mm -hmm. we can spend anywhere from 20 minutes to an hour on each one of those 12 skills. Oh, easily. You, you, know? could, write, you could write a thesis oh, on each ridiculous. one of those. Oh, it's ridiculous. And I love yeah. teaching it. I really, right. I, I enjoy it, you know, and what I'm trying to get going here is the opportunity to teach this and right. the opportunity for people. I understand it's not everybody's cup of tea. That's cool. But right. I want to put it out there for people who do, right, and who want so, to learn this. Let's end on this then because part of – obviously you need resilience to just have the grit to make it through right. for the day-to-day -day stuff. But kind of what sparked this conversation was like the uptick in suicide. Right. And for a while back we had – there was like 22 a day or something like that yeah. on average veterans – and that doesn't include uh, people that we lost to heroin addiction exactly. and who exactly, just like yeah. completely checked out of life. You know, they may not have left our physical plane of existence there and you know, their body yeah. may, may not be decomposing, but they're checked out yeah. useless anyway. Right. You know, it, it, so you, you can probably raise that the number. There, you know, that uh, people who commit suicide have probably felt dead long before they went through, right. right, with the act, you know, oh, yeah. pulled the trigger, so to speak. Yeah. And so resilience... And and, and there's it, there's also, like, there's active suicide and there's passive suicide. Yeah, absolutely. So you can, yeah, you can just... Yeah, you can there's... never actually want to want to go through with the deed, but right. you can be behaving in a manner that is completely reckless, right, right, that passive, that passive way. And, yeah. and I think that's the big takeaway, right? Resilience is about how to not just be alive, Mm -hmm. but how to thrive, right? how to embrace the chaos of life. Right. You're not ignoring the bad. You're just acknowledging that it's there and you're moving forward. So I want to add on, I want to end on that. So I'm going to ask you to say that again, because it's so important. Okay. You have to keep saying that. But the other thing that is important to say, since we did start out with talking about suicide is what do you do if you see somebody or what do you do if you suspect somebody is dealing with that kind of thing? Right. Because you have to, that's another thing that we, you got to keep drilling in. Right. You know, you got to check your playbook. And you got to right, make right, sure right. you got the muscle memory in in place because if you do see somebody that you suspect, you got to know yeah. what to do. I think the big thing for that is is paying attention to your people, knowing your people, right? Knowing the way that they are on a daily basis, being aware, having that awareness, right? Mm -hmm. But what I always say is if you notice someone who is actually no kidding in that situation, even as a master resilience trainer, I'm not a doctor. Right. right. I am not. Uh, I am not a trained professional to do that. So what right. I'm going to do in that environment is I'm going to engage them as a human being. Mm -hmm. Right. I'm going to let them know, hey, I am here for you. Right. right. You don't have to do this. You don't have to go through this alone. I'm going to be here with you, mm -hmm. but I'm going to get you the help that you need. Right. You know, because it is so important that we do that. We get them the help that we need. Mm -hmm. But I'm also a believer that, you know, as a leader and as a human being. Right? We have opportunities to impact people way before they get to that breaking point. Yes. You know what I mean? And, and, yep. and, and I'm a big believer on that. You know, empower people. Mm -hmm. Build them up. It's not about say I am, you know, in Vegas I was known you know, as, as the iron fist of discipline in my shop, right? Mm -hmm. I will dis I'm not a, afraid to do that. But at the same time, if all you're doing is, is hammering someone down, mm. right, you got to build them back up. Right. You got you got to build them back up, you yep. know. And so at the end of the day that that's my big takeaway of all of this, you know. And the suicide thing, that's my take on it is mm -hmm. know your people because if you know your people, you truly know your people, you're going to know when they have a bad day. And right. something as simple as sitting down and having a conversation and saying, "What's yeah. going on? How are you?" Yep. Like all work aside, how are you? Yep. That is enough to open up the dialogue to peel back the onion and find out what is actually going on.
Yep. And we, we get busy. We don't do it, you, you know, which is unfortunate. But resilience at the end of the day, that is my takeaway, right? Not just living, thriving, right. Right. learning how to embrace the chaos, not ignoring the bad, accepting it, moving forward, because that's what it comes down to. You know, yeah. you can get a lot of crap for being an optimist in the military. You know, mm-hmm. it, it, you can get a lot of crap. But at the end of the day, I've never wanted to follow a negative, destructive, angry leader. <laughs> I've never wanted to no, follow that. Nobody Ever. does. Nobody that does. does not inspire people. No. You know, and, and so the big thing that I, I like to say is we appoint leaders sometimes in the military. Mm-hmm. You're the highest ranking. You're going to be the leader. Right. It doesn't always work that way, right? You still have to do your leg of the work, well, and, you know, to, to earn the respect and earn the trust. But we're all leaders. Right, absolutely. Like, no matter where you are, you're yeah. a leader. Right. You know, like, in, in different ways, you know, I've led full bird colonels. Right. Even though I'll never, I can't dream of getting to that level yeah. of, of rank. Right. But in, in different ways, like, everybody's a leader. So one person may have the responsibility for a decision. Right. But everybody has to be leading everybody right. together as part of the team. Yeah, you know? no, definitely. So, yeah. You know, it's interesting. And, and that's it. That, that to me is resilience. It's not soft. It's not, we're going to talk about our feelings all the time. No, it's, it's embracing the conflict. It's embracing the chaos. It's thriving in that environment. It's learning yeah. what you need to do. Being aware of your needs and the needs of those around you. Right. Right. And allowing you to move throughout that environment. Allowing you to not experience always that post-traumatic stress. Are you going to? Yeah. Because we, we, we said that. We don't ignore that something is going to happen that could break you. Right. But we want to find meaning. We want to de- make meaning and grow. Deliberately changing it from post-traumatic stress to post-traumatic growth. Right. Exactly. Which is, I think, a good place to stop. Yeah, absolutely. I think, yeah, this is good. Yeah, I enjoy it. You, yeah, we should... Um... We can do this again. Yeah, we'll see how it goes. <laughs> For sure. All right. I appreciate it. Yeah, I don't want to keep you up from your class. No, so. no, it was it was perfect, right on time. I really hope this motivated you. Sergeant Picard talks fast and throws out a lot of information, but it's all really good. Use this to get yourself on your toes if you're on your heels. If you are struggling with suicidal thoughts, get help. It's worth it. There are countless veteran suicide prevention resources out there. Military One Stop, the website that people talk about a lot, has the phone numbers that I use. Or you can call Behavioral Health here in Post or at the base that you, where you are. You can talk to your commander, your first sergeant, you can call me. Get yourself help. We need you. More than anything else, keep flying, keep fighting, and keep winning.